Okay, so welcome to TripStop's uh, September webinar. Uh, tonight we will be talking about how to establish new habits, so making and breaking habits. Um, I will talk for about 45 minutes, and this time I promise I will really try to talk only for 45 minutes, and then we will go to the Q&A part, as always. Uh, as I'm talking, uh, please, you can ask any questions that you have. I'll just ask you to use the Q&A uh, option on, the, on, uh, on your screens so that I can go through all the questions um, when I finish. Uh, you, don't you don't have to stick to only uh, habit formation. You can ask anything that you would like to know about hair pulling. Uh, so uh, let's see first what our topics will be for, for tonight. So yeah, I forgot, this is me with pre-COVID hair. Uh, everyone, uh, so if you didn't join the program yet and you're considering joining, um, keep in mind that the TrickStop is giving everyone who's attending the webinar a $60 discount for the first month and you need two months to complete the program. So that's, that's a, quite a good discount. It's only valid for one week after this evening. So keep an eye on that. I also put this on the last slide, so in case you need to think about it a little more. So this is what we'll be talking about tonight. So first, of course, if we're talking about habits, we have to say what habits are and to give a, at least a provisional definition of habits. We will talk about intention and motivation and what role do these play in habit formation. And then I will break down how the process of habit development goes and what exact steps you need to take to introduce new habits. And then throughout the, throughout the talk, I will be sort of sprinkling it with useful tips on what to do and practical examples, which hopefully you will find useful. Um, so let's, without any delay, let's, let's get started. And I have to move myself on the right. I, will, I have to. Con I always forget that there is a webcam image, and then I always make these presentations so that my face is obscuring something. So let's start with what habits are. So habits are automatically triggered actions in specific circumstances. This was the, the shortest definition that I could find. I will send you a paper that I found that describes a lot of the material that I will go through in, I think, very accessible terms. So you will receive this after the webinar in case you want to read a little more. So there are three key words here, even though I only highlighted two because I want to put special emphasis on these two. So automatically, actions and circumstances, those are three most important words here. Uh, automatically meaning that habits are not something that we actually have to consciously think about, it's just something that we do. So you don't have to set a conscious intention for something that is already habitual. So you just kind of, your body does it itself. And then actions, because when I say actions, I don't necessarily only mean specific behaviors. I also think mental actions as well. So we can talk about, for example, hair pulling, having an aspect that, uh, of being a habit among other things, but, or we can talk about brushing our teeth, or we can talk about making habits out of, um, I don't know, doing mindfulness or whatever. Uh, but we can also talk about having habitual patterns of thought as well. So when I say action, I don't necessarily mean physical action. I just mean an activity of some kind. And then specific circumstances, meaning that every habit has a specific context that it's limited to. So habits don't just flow around in your psychological space and then can be activated anywhere. They're usually anchored in one context. So that can be something external or something internal. When it's external, it's usually very easy to see. So if we talk about hair pulling, for example, um, people will frequently say, well, I pull when I'm in meetings or I will pull when I'm watching TV or I will pull my hair only when I'm uh, in bed before going to sleep. So very frequently it is limited to a specific context or a specific space. But then sometimes the context can also be internal. And when I say internal, that can be an emotion, a set of emotions, a body sensation, a mood, anything along these lines. But the point is, is that a habit is always limited by something. And this is very important to think about. We will see later on when we talk about how to establish habits. 
we will pay very important, very special attention to the context in which we want to establish a habit. Because having a very well described context for a habit makes it much easier to, to introduce and then maintain. Uh, one way that you can think about habits, uh, if, you, if, this, if this is not your first webinar, then you know that I, I use a lot of art as examples. And every artist, or at least good ones, have a very specific style to them. So this is obviously Monet on the left. And the way that Monet painted is also a habit. And it's actually a very good example of habit formation because this kind of style is something that Monet had to consciously invent and introduce. And then over the years as he painted, it kind of became habitual. So he didn't have to say, okay, let me now sit down and paint like Monet. Because of the repetition, it kind of became a second nature to him. So these are four here on this slide, you have four very important qualities of every habit. One is that habits make us more efficient. Whenever you turn something into habitual behavior, it becomes more efficient because you don't really have to actively think about it. It just kind of does itself. It, it becomes like a machine, essentially. So uh, they're also very useful. When we talk about pooling, it's, it's not very intuitive to talk about pooling as being useful for anything, but every habit that is established for one reason or another has precisely that, a reason. So every habit that exists does something. We cannot control habits. And I didn't phrase this very well, so I have to clarify. We can, for example, I use brushing our teeth as, as a habit that most of us hopefully have. Uh, you can, of course, control brushing your teeth, meaning that you, when you brush your teeth, you can simply stop and walk away. And then it, that's something that is in our power of control, but it's so habitual that you don't actually have to think about every aspect of brushing your teeth. You don't have to say, so now I'm going to move the brush to the right, now I'm going to move the brush to the left, right? Because it is something that you've done so many times that maybe a better way to phrase it would be that there is no need to control them. The reason why I'm underscoring this is because even when we talk about hair pulling, there is a difference between something that is a habit and something that's a compulsion. You know, compulsive behavior, we have a very hard time controlling. And I, so I, I don't want to generalize your experiences, but usually when we talk about pulling, we talk about two categories of pulling. We talk about focused pulling, which is when you're fully aware of what's happening and you kind of focus on pulling. That frequently leads to what people call the pulling trance. And that's something we will talk about next month. And then there's that kind of pulling where you just find yourself pulling. Just you're reading something or scrolling through your phone and then just suddenly you realize that you're pulling your hair, right? So pulling can have the compulsive aspect, one that is very difficult to consciously control. And then it can also have this purely habitual aspect. This is why I said on the previous slide, or, or the one before that, that pulling has this aspect of being a habit, but that I don't like to reduce it to merely being a habit. Because as we've seen, if you've attended any of the previous webinars, you must have seen that there are layers and layers of psychology that are sort of stacked on top of pulling. So it's, if we talk about it as a habit, we have to say that it is a highly meaningful habit. And then the last important characteristic of habits is that they don't actually feel intentional. So what do I mean by this? Uh, like I said, habits are useful for something, so they serve a purpose. But because they're so automated, because we do them so mindlessly, you don't really have to set a conscious intention to do something. So to give you the example with brushing your teeth, you don't have to set a conscious intention to have clean teeth. It's something that you do twice a day and you do it without much thought. So you're aware that you're doing it, but you don't really have to wonder why. Intention is embedded in the habit, but it's not conscious. That's what this means. However, when, as you will see later on, when you go through the process of establishing a habit, you actually have to start from the intention, even though habits itself, themselves don't seem intentional. And then, of course, I mean, this would not be a, a webinar of mine if I did not mention Kelly. 
So I'm going to tell you briefly about uh, how Kelly thought about our behavior, and then I will try to bring it down to a very practical level. So just bear with me for five minutes. So Kelly thought about our psychological life as something that takes place on different levels of awareness. So there are some parts of our experience that we can very easily communicate with words, and then there are some that we cannot so easily express. So if you, if you ask me, do I want this webinar to be useful rather than useless? I'm going to, of course, say that it's useful, or rather that I want it to be useful. You know, whether or not it will be useful, time will tell. But my point is, is that my intention for the webinar is something that I can very easily express with words. In fact, there's a lot about human psychology that I can very easily express with words because I'm very well equipped with the psychological vocabulary. But then, as we kind of go deeper and deeper and think about our own psyche and the way that we see the world, you will see that very quickly when we explore our inner world, we start lacking words. Sometimes we'll be able to express things with visual symbols, and this is why I often use art, because I find that art can convey many things that words cannot. Sometimes sounds will do that. Sometimes when things are really, really low on the level of cognitive awareness, they will manifest themselves as kind of vague body sensations or body movements. Right? And this is where habits abide. This is where they live. And for a very sort of plastic example, at least in my mind, is when you compare a scientific journal where every word has to be clearly defined and every sentence should be clear and concise. And then on the other side, you have poetry where basically everything the poet wants to say is somewhere between the words, not in the words. And this is exactly what our psychological life looks like. Uh, when people start the program, I will very frequently talk about emotions and I will always ask them, so what do you feel before pulling, during pulling, afterwards? And then sometimes people will be able to articulate what they feel before or especially after if it's guilt or regret or gratification or release, but they will usually lack precise words because if you think about it, release is not a very precise way to define what we feel because well, our bodies and our minds are capable of, re of release in so many different ways that saying release really means very little. So when it comes to expressing our emotions, we really usually lack words and it takes a lot of effort to precisely define them. And this is exactly where habits live, on these levels of awareness where we know that something is happening, we can observe the behavior, but we really don't have a clear way of communicating it. Kelly thought that so, because you have to sort of just, just a little bit of context. So Kelly wrote his theory in the 40s and the 50s. By that time, you basically had two schools in psychology. You had behaviorism, and then you had Freud. Uh, Kelly was in constant dialogue with Freud, just like everyone else, sometimes agreeing, sometimes disagreeing. And then Kelly had a very a kind of more general idea than Freud. He would say, sure, sometimes we suppress things because they're unacceptable, sometimes because they're, um, they're very difficult to digest, sometimes because we're terrified of them. But sometimes we also kind of suppress, and I use that term loosely now, because when Kelly means suppress, he just means remove words from something. Kelly says that sometimes we do this because it's pragmatic, because there's a kind of psychological economy to this. In fact, Kelly says that the more things we leave at this unconscious, automatic level, the better for us, because then we can release a lot of our capacity to do other things. Uh, in his book, Kelly uses the example of breathing and, so, and talks about how breathing is just very complex physiological process. And imagine if you actually have to do it consciously, we wouldn't really be doing anything else. I mean, I have been, let me see, I've been talking for 12 minutes at this point, I would have been dead if I had to consciously think about breathing because I would have to choose whether I want to breathe or talk. And if I choose talking, goodbye. So having a lot of things unconscious and kind of automatized makes us more efficient. To give you a less dramatic example, I really like to walk and I will go on very long walks on weekends, sometimes 20, 30 miles. And luckily I don't really have to think how to move my legs. 
that's also habitual and unconscious. Our bodies just do that. And then I can spend my capacities thinking or listening to books or podcasts or whatever else I'm doing. So for Kelly, having things unconscious is sometimes extremely useful. The trouble, however, is that when you want to change these processes, then you run into problems. Namely, because habits don't exist on high levels of awareness, if you want to change them, you have to approach them on the exact same level on which they persist. So if habits are these nonverbal components, these nonverbal behaviors, then changing habits is also not going to be a very verbal thing, meaning you cannot argue with your body. There's no talking yourself out of a habit. So you have to adopt a different approach. This is similar to, for example, like if I want to communicate effectively, I have to speak the language that my audience speaks. So I can deliver this exact same webinar in Italian, for example. But I wonder how many people would be able to follow me or understand me. So if I want to be understood, I have to speak the language that people will understand. Now, the same goes for habits. If you actually want your body to understand what is it that you want it to do, you have to speak the language that your body understands. This is especially important when we initiate and try to learn habits. And I will come back to this point over and over again and illustrate it with more practical examples. To begin with, two examples. Um, so on the, let's start with the one on the left. So this is a photograph from a performance by Marina Abramovich and Ulai. It was called Rest Energy. Now, this may not seem like much because it's just a photograph. And the performance is actually quite short, only a couple of minutes. But for me personally, this is one of the most powerful works of art that I have ever seen. So let me just walk you through this. And then I will tell you how this relates to what I was just talking about. So both of them had microphones attached to their chest. And so everyone in the room who was present could hear their hearts beating very loudly. They used their, the, the, they used their body weight to kind of keep the bow and arrow in, in, in balance. And Ulai is holding the arrow with only a few fingers. And the arrow is pointed directly at her heart. Now, if you know, Marina's work, you know that she's done some very crazy stuff over the years, and she usually says that this was the most terrifying performance piece that she has ever done. And the reason why is because the whole piece was about trust and intimacy and vulnerability. Imagine the level of trust you have to have to allow someone to do this to you. Just for a second, put yourself in her shoes. And if you have a partner, just put your partner in Ulai's shoes and imagine if his fingers had trembled for a second, she'd be dead. There is no first aid, there's no, there is no medicine that would help her. That arrow would go straight through her heart. Now, when we sort of discuss this performance, you can say, well, that was crazy or that was amazing or this was that or that was that. But just try to put yourself in her shoes. Like I start sweating immediately when I think about this. And this is because this performance piece doesn't really resonate with me intellectually. It's an experiential thing. That degree of trust is also extremely terrifying. And why it's terrifying, it's very difficult to say. But when they do this with a bow and arrow, they tell me everything I need to know. So that is one way how we can communicate with those levels of our mind that are not conscious. Now, the, I will just briefly go over the example on the right. So the, the man on the photograph is Prokofiev, the Russian composer, and then the woman is Martha Argerich, who plays Prokofiev in a way that no one else does, if you ask me. So Prokofiev has, has written quite a lot of very good music, but my favorite piece is his third piano concerto, specifically the third movement. There's something about that movement that just makes my whole body explode. It just kind of it feels like, a, I don't know, like there's a volcano going off inside of me. It, I just cannot, it's like I'm on fire when I listen to it. And usually, like by the end of the piece, especially when she plays it, she plays like the devil. There's something very special about the way she plays. And yes, I know, I sound like an idiot right now. And that's exactly my point. The only way that I can possibly convey to you 
how powerful that concerto is, is if I play the third movement, specifically its last part, let's say the last third, and just kind of stare at you like this. And then when these pieces come that my body reacts to intensely, all I can do is say this, can you hear this? Can you feel this? But there's absolutely no way that I can communicate with words what I feel. I can intellectualize it endlessly. Like I'm, I know that the piece, that the third movement starts in A minor, I think, and then I know exactly with the orchestra, and then I know exactly how it's done, how it finishes, and I can tell you all these pretentious things, but none of that explains why I, I just feel like I'm burning up when I listen. So this is the trouble when we have to communicate with these parts of ourselves, because we're taught, our culture teaches us to privilege words over all other forms of communication, because words are very easy. We kind of agree on what words mean, and then we can exchange meaning very easily. But we have these parts of ourselves, and needless to say, parts of other people as well, that we have to live with, and that we can never fully express with words. So when we want to communicate that, we have to be very careful and very attentive. What I'm trying to say here is that before you can introduce a habit, before your body will accept a habit, you have to learn what this habit will mean for your body. And we will now go into details about how you can do that. Uh, I hope I'm being clear by so far. Uh, I see that you're asking questions and please ask away. Any part of this, if it doesn't make sense, I will be very happy to clarify. So these are the three main fa phases of habit formation. Initiation, learning, and stability. We will go through each of these, and then I will tell you sort of how you can go about making the best out of each stage. And I will give you a few personal examples about certain habits that I was trying to introduce, what was easy, what wasn't easy, and how I went about problem solving that. And specifically, I will pay attention to the, to the part that I was just emphasizing with music and art and the kind of how I understand what my body will accept and what it will not accept as a habit. I don't know why, but I seem to be missing something, such as the text of this. Well, that is weird. I apologize for this. When I was looking at the presentation, it worked perfectly, but apparently. Not now. Uh, so what it says here, um, okay. So basically the first stage is the stage, let me go back here at least. So it's the stage of initiation. This is where two things come into play. One is your intention and second, uh, it's your motivation. So these two things are incredibly important. And why? Let me give you an example. Last month, we talked about mindfulness. And after the webinar, I received a lot of emails from you saying that you were very interested in it and you want to learn mindfulness. And you were wondering if I can recommend you more resources than I did. And this happens to me very frequently. When I talk about mindfulness, people are very interested. And then they want to learn. And then I say, OK, I will teach you. And then as I start teaching them, their enthusiasm just goes away. First, they realize that it's not that easy. And second of all, they become a little bit lost in it. They realize that it's a powerful practice, but they struggle to figure out why is it that they need this practice. The thing is, if you, want, if you remember in the beginning, I mentioned that habits are always useful. So if you want to introduce a new set of behaviors, for example, if we talk about hair pulling, we want to introduce a competing habit, specifically as part of the habit reversal training, we introduce competing responses, right? So you have to be very clear about what your intention is. And setting the intention by, by saying, I'm going to introduce this habit to get rid of pulling, this is not a good way to go about it because it's too general and too vague. Remember, habits take place in a context and they're very highly structured automatic behaviors. So what you need to have is exactly what type of behavior you want to introduce which part of pulling you want to eliminate, and then what's the appropriate context for this habit. All this goes into setting your intention, because unless you have a clear intention, you are not going to have enough motivation to go through it. I hope this is, this is clear, so, so that I can go one step further. Once you know exactly and precisely what you want to do, 
then you need to figure out how to achieve what you're doing. This requires you to focus on that part of tooling that you want to replace, meaning that you have to learn how to be mindful of your body movements when you pull. Uh, when, you, when you start Trick Stop, the program, in the second week, what we do is we break up your pulling into all sorts of little details. And there's a very long worksheet that people usually think is very annoying in session two, where you kind of analyze every specific movement and I tend to ask many concrete questions because it is extremely important that you become mindful of how you pull. So it's not the same if your hand goes like this or if your hand goes like this, or if you pull your hair, I'm showing this because that's the part of the video you can see, or if you pull your hair on your arms or your chest or wherever else you may pull. So the movement itself is important. You may ask why? Well, because this is already a part of an established habit. So this is something that your body already does habitually. This is already done. So what you can do is you can make use of the movement that's already there and then just build on it, alter its very ending. So analyze what's the most natural procedure that you already have or what's most similar to the habit that you already have established. Because if you have to learn the last 10% again, it's much easier than you have to establish a completely different thing. So when people choose competing responses in trick stop in session three, in whatever program you are, well, whenever you, you get to that part, they usually choose those competing responses that seem very easy to apply or that usually require them to buy stuff because, well, people like to buy stuff. So they're going to order like 20 different fidget toys or whatever. These are all good and they can work, but you have to be very mindful of how you use them. So it has to be something that you can consistently use in one context. If you pull while you, for example, watch TV while you're in the bathroom and let's say in your office, you have to think very carefully whether or not one competing response will do in all three situations. Or maybe you need three, you need three different competing responses or two. So you go about doing that by analyzing how you pull in each of these situations on a very concrete level, as I just described. So how your hand moves, uh, how your hand feels, how your, how your entire body feels. And then the second thing is to take a look at the context. If it's the bathroom, where do you pull in the bathroom? Is it in front of the mirror? Is it on the toilet? Is it in the shower or somewhere else? If it's in your office, where in your office? All this can help you find the, the best possible competing, re competing response. It should be something that doesn't deviate too much from all the habits that you already established. When we get to the last stage here, we will talk about stacking habits. So when you already have a routine for something, it's very easy to just squeeze in another habit. To give you an example, long time ago when I was starting to do mindfulness, I quickly realized that I want to make this a habit. So I decided to just squeeze it in in the middle of my morning routine. It's not like I have a very complicated morning routine. I just get out of my bed, go to the bathroom, brush my teeth, shower, and then proceed with everything else. But then I thought that it would be very easy to put meditation literally between the bed and the bathroom. So what I did is that I bought a meditation cushion and just put it right next to my bed. So that my habit was, my new habit was the following. Instead of getting out of my bed and walking to the bathroom, I would have to get out of my bed, sit on the cushion, meditate for a certain period of time, and then get up and walk into the bathroom. Because that way, I didn't really disrupt the natural flow, flow of the habit that I already have established. I just added one little bit into it. And it was an incredibly easy habit to establish. Actually, when I decided to do mindfulness, my morning routine was basically immediately established because I was able to introduce it in something that was already habitual and stable. So that's habit stacking, and that's something that's very useful to think about in these initiation stages. So you have to be clear about what your motivation is, what you want to achieve, and then you have to figure out the exact precise mechanics of it before you even start doing anything. If you improvise the habit, you're very likely to just quit midway through the second stage if you even get there. So this was the this was the first stage. That's basically what it says here in these mysterious rules. 
So second of all, I emphasize the mechanics of the, of the new habit and of the already existing habits. This is because, as I mentioned, you have to do what your body understands. That means that when your body does something right, you should reward it. So when you succeed in applying a habit, you have to reward yourself. Now, what's an appropriate reward? Well, I can't exactly tell you because that's, that depends on each and every one of you individually. It should not be something that is logical or reasonable. It should be something that feels good. So not something that you know is good, something that actually feels good. Uh, since I'm talking about mindfulness, this is like a semi-personal example. As, as I was sort of getting more involved with mindfulness and becoming more interested in it, I decided to introduce a second mindfulness sitting every day, which would be in the afternoon or evening. And that was extremely difficult to introduce because there was no routine that I could insert it into. And I had to figure out many things, among them how to reward myself. And then I, as I was learning new techniques, I, I realized that there's such a thing as mindful eating. So what I did was, and please don't laugh. I know that I cannot hear you, but I will be able to feel you laughing because people always laugh at me when I give this example. Uh, what I did was I introduced after my mindfulness session, I introduced five minutes of mindful eating. I like jello very much. Like the texture of it feels very good. The way it melts in my mouth, the just completely artificial taste of it. I like all of it. Especially the type of jello that has something like whipped cream on it, like scattered everywhere in the, oh, I love that one. So I would just add five minutes of eating jello after every mindfulness session. I know it sounds silly, but for my body, that was a good reward because my body really enjoys that. It enjoys the, the taste and, and just all of it. So that was a signal to my body that I did well. This is, I, will, I will go back to this point once more because it is very important. We are always tempted when we do something to say, oh, good, you did it. But then when we fail at something, to be very hard on ourselves because we failed. And that does not make for good habit habit formation techniques, not at all. So you cannot punish yourself, you have to reward yourself. Second thing is you have to make your expectations realistic. Pulling as a habit usually takes years to be established. So if you want to replace pulling with another habit, you will take time to establish that other habit. There's simply no way around it. If you're establishing a new habit, you will fail. A new habit is not natural. So sometimes we will have to fail. And this is why we have to form realistic expectations. If you, if you, um, so if you want to establish, let's say using, um, I'm looking what I, so I have a worry stone here. So let's say you want to use a worry stone or, or a spinner ring or, well, that's all I have here. So one of these two, every time you want to pull. This is going to be something new. And spinner rings are very practical as our, pool, as our worry stones because you can carry them everywhere with you, basically. So, you know, a ring is on your finger and you can play with it anytime. Even though it's very available and very practical, it's still something new. So for every five times that you remember, you will forget twice in the first week. And this is something that you really have to embed in your expectations in advance. Treat failures like questions. When you fail, as you inevitably will from time to time, you already failed. So the best thing that you can do is learn from the failure. This is why I say that you should treat it as a, as a question because this is your body telling you that in this particular situation, there was something that didn't work well. So there's a, there's a chance to learn about pulling and why is it that this specific repeating response failed? I can give you a, a practical example there regarding the, the mindfulness thing that I was just saying with Jello. It was very difficult for me because after work, I would feel the need to just kind of de-stress before mindfulness, which I know sounds silly because mindfulness is a way to de-stress, but that was my excuse at the time. And then I said, well, okay, maybe I can eat and then do mindfulness. And then when I tried that, I would just fall asleep because with my stomach full and being tired, it didn't work out well. So I told myself, fine. You can go to the gym and then you'll do mindfulness afterwards. Well, that also didn't work out very well because after the gym, I would be too tired or I would fall asleep or I would just tell myself, well, 
you're really exhausted, so you might as well go to sleep because you'll fall asleep anyway. It was really very difficult. And so, and it was frustrating because in general, I'm a person that really easily establishes new routines. So what I had to do is take a step back and think about like, why is it that I'm not succeeding at this? Like, I, I easily meditate every morning, even though I'm not a morning person and I hate myself and the world before morning coffee, and yet I managed to meditate. So what is it about this that I cannot do? Like, why is it that afternoons or evenings are so difficult? And the more I kept thinking about this, the more I realized that my main excuse for not doing mindfulness is that I am too tired and that I need to unwind. Even though, obviously, mindfulness is one of the best ways of, for stress reduction that we have, would achieve exactly that. And then I realized that what I mean when I say de-stress or unwind, I actually mean ignore my own thoughts, which of course, being a therapist meant that I have to pay very close attention to my thoughts. So I did. And then I realized that even though my work ends usually 6 or 7 p.m., I keep thinking about work. So my patients' voices stay in my mind. I think about their problems somewhere in the back of my head which means that when I stopped working, I didn't actually stop working. And when I was avoiding mindfulness, I was indirectly actually avoiding work, or at least echoes of work that would still stay in my mind. So that meant that before I could establish mindfulness as a good habit, what I have to do is find a way to separate work from my private life, meaning that I have to establish better boundaries with work. And what I did then was learn how to reorganize my schedule and sort of how to make a good transition between work and then the rest of my day. But until I resolved that issue, I wasn't able to stabilize my mindfulness practice. Meaning that when you resist forming a new habit, you have to take a step back and see what your resistance means. You have to be patient because obviously you will fail time and time again. I was recently asked, when I talk about being patient with habit formation and change in general, what on earth am I talking about? What does it mean to be patient? I have to say it was a very difficult question. My final answer, or at least final for now, is that when I say be patient, what I actually mean is you have to accept the fact that some habits will be introduced quickly, some will take forever. But this is not up to you. You can be precise, you can be diligent, you can try over again, you can try different methods. But the way your body changes and the way your body remembers, because habits require our bodies to remember, not our minds to remember, that's not up to you to say how quickly it will happen. You can maybe slightly accelerate it with good methodology, what we're talking about now, but there's only so much that you can do. So you have to accept that the, the, the speed of your change does not necessarily depend on you. It's not something that you control. So that's what patience is to me. It's a form of acceptance. Be precise and be mindful can, I guess, be combined into one. Because what I mean is that once you establish a set of things that you need to do for your new habit, make it your business to follow the, the procedure that you have established. Do it even slowly, if necessary, because your body needs to remember the procedure. So you have to be very intentional about it every time. So... Reward works, punishment doesn't. And punishment is almost like a default. When I work with people who have BFRBs, one of the very common themes that, that I see over and over and over again is how hard everyone is on themselves. So people will start using competing responses. They will be happy for two days because they work very easily. But then the first instance of failure, and what you get is, I can't do this, this will never work, or they will try another one and then that one will also fail eventually at one point. And then they will say, there's really no hope for me. I've tried everything, which usually means three, means three to four things. Um, nothing works, I, I'm just doomed. I'm a failure and so on and so on. I'm guessing some of you can recognize how that movie goes. Now, punishment really doesn't work. Think about it, if, if, if you're on a crossroads somewhere and you have you're coming from one direction, you have three others to choose from. And someone tells you the best direction to go in is not left. How do you know where to go? Because not left just means not left, but it really doesn't mean where you should go. 
And the same goes with punishment. Punishment means not this, not there, not here, however you want to go about it, but it just means no. And no doesn't actually tell you what to do. Even when you, and, and I'm sorry for the comparison, but it is really appropriate. Even when you train a dog, for example, you have to be precise. So you reward the dog by giving it, giving it a treat when it does something well. You will say sit if you want the dog to sit. You're not going to say don't, don't walk, right? Because that's really not a very useful thing to say. And the same goes for our bodies and our minds as well. So when you're establishing a new habit and you reward yourself, you're actually telling you both your body and your mind, this is the direction to go into. My body understands gel is good job, keep doing that. But if instead I tell myself, will you please just sit down and meditate? It's not going to get me far. The same thing goes if you yell at a dog. The dog will just be scared, but it's not going to learn what it needs to do. So reward works because it points us in the right direction. Punishment doesn't because it doesn't do much. Imagine if I introduced myself by saying, by saying, good evening, my name is not Michael. That's exactly what you do when you punish yourself. You tell yourself, congratulations, you need to do something differently. Not very useful. And then I just have to emphasize this point once more, which is that resistance is information. Resistance is not always, so I use this, I, I love this sculpture. It's a memorial uh, for, for um, a battle from World War II in Bosnia. It's just stunning, like just remarkable. But resistance is not always as dramatic as this, as this memorial is. So resistance can be very subtle. Resistance can be, uh, I know I should be using a competing response right now, but I'm tired, so I'll just pull for two minutes. That's resistance. Resistance is when you say, I'm very angry, so I will give myself permission to pull. Resistance is sometimes when you just fall asleep. Resistance is when you don't remember. So resistance is every time when you choose not to use the new habit and instead use the old one or use nothing. And resistance is always information. It teaches you something about pulling. It teaches you about what's not completely good about the habit that you're establishing. And it's also teaching you about underlying causes that you need to address. If you remember my example with mindfulness and work-life boundaries, what my resistance was telling me is you need to find a better way to address how you feel about your work. You need to learn how to leave your work when your sessions are over. Because I, I could try and then schedule my mindfulness at six or seven or eight or nine or 10, but what, what the problem was is that I really wasn't drawing good boundaries between work and the rest of my life. So resistance can teach you a lot about how you should go about forming habits. And there's also another thing. If you try to replace pulling with another habit, for example, the, let's say the spinner ring that I mentioned, or a squeeze toy or anything else, Chances are the new habit is not going to be as gratifying as pulling itself. It will only replace a part of the experience. Sometimes this is not going to be very important, especially with the, those mindless aspects of pulling. So you'll just catch yourself, apply a competing response, and that's it. But sometimes you will really need the gratification. If you remember the beginning when I was talking about habits being useful and doing something, Moments of resistance can shed a little bit of light on what pulling is doing for you, which part of the, of the habit you didn't successfully replace. It can tell you about your psychological needs, or it can tell you simply what you're doing wrong about the habit that you're introducing. So always make sure to address resistance. If you like to journal, journaling is really very good for this. When you receive the paper, I suppose on Monday, because I'm not sending it, so I'm not really sure when it will go out, but either tomorrow or maybe on Monday, there, there will be like an example of a table that you can use to track your habits. But if you do journaling, that's even better. Then you can really, really analyze your resistance. You can simply list it and then from time to time go back and see what's in common, what keeps repeating itself, 
or you can just let your mind free associate on any kind of excuse that you get. And over time, you will gather enough material to really understand what is happening. And also journaling is really very good because it kind of reinforces your intention and amplifies your motivation to, to establish new habits. And then at one point, hopefully, as you become more and more, as you kind of embed the habit in your everyday life, there will come a point of a, of a plateau, let's say, when the habit will come, become stable. So you have successfully learned that when you watch TV, you have to rub your worry stone, or you have to sit on your hands, or you have to wear gloves, or whatever we're working with. And it became a routine. So can you stop actively trying to establish a habit? Mm, not quite. Pulling still likely has years of being a habit ahead of the new habit. So you have to retain a level of vigilance. You have to track and pay attention to your excuses. So even when something is a permanent stable habit, we still don't do it 100% of the time. And as I was researching this webinar, I was trying to find statistics that would, uh, that would be helpful to show this. And I found a really gross example, but I think it really illustrates the point well. Brushing your teeth. I mentioned this in the beginning in passing. That's something that our parents teach us to do. Hopefully something that we expect of ourselves to do. Something that society strongly encourages us to do because no one really likes to smell anyone's bad breath. You would think this is a habit that everyone has established. And so I found one survey that said that 70% of Americans brush their teeth twice a day, which means that 30% don't. That's every third person, more or less. So every third person on this call doesn't brush their teeth twice a day. And then I started thinking, of these people who say that they brush their teeth twice a day, so the 70%, how many of them have once or twice or five times fallen asleep before brushing their teeth, for example? So even with habits that are so deeply ingrained, we skip sometimes. We are never 100% compliant. So we need to be very vigilant about the excuses that we have and these moments when we, let's say, accidentally fail. So sometimes we will skip it without any major consequences. But it is important to keep track of these things because they can teach us about what's happening with pulling and whether or not there's some underlying tension or urges that are maybe too weak for us to explicitly notice, but something that needs to be addressed. And then when you travel or move or change your environment, it's really important to be attentive. Because if you go on vacation for two weeks and you have a set of habits established, when you go on vacation, all of them can go away. This is not a problem with some habits that have been there for years and years, but when you're establishing a new habit, taking a two week break from it can be deadly for the habit. So it can be very difficult to come back from, from, a, from a giant hole like this. So when you, when you have to travel somewhere, you have to plan ahead see how to incorporate the habit, be very, be proactive, basically. I guess that's what I'm saying. So you don't have to constantly remind yourself why you're in, doing, doing something new, but you have to be vigilant about any changes, about any disruptions, and when you can anticipate disruptions, find a way to work around them. I don't always carry my meditation cushion with me, but I've been meditating for 10 years. So by now I will just by default sit anywhere. When I'm waiting in line at the grocery store, I'll just spontaneously focus on my breath. But the first couple of years, where I would always travel with my meditation cushion, wherever I go, just put it next to my bed. And that way I carry the key component of my environment so that my habit can persist. And then as you establish a stable habit, you can stack habits, as I mentioned before. So when you use one competing response, uh, let's say in session three, you establish um, to use a squeeze toy or a breathing exercise as your competing response. As you progress to the program and you learn more complicated techniques, you simply insert these techniques between a competing response and the urge to pull. Because the arc between the, the urge and the competing response is already established and stable, you can add different techniques there. 
And then if they work better, it can slowly reduce or eliminate competing responses and then use these more advanced techniques along. But the key is that once you have a procedure established, you can then make it complicated or add more things to it. Okay, so this is everything that I have to say, and I was almost on time. Um, so uh, just before we move on to the q and A, I I just want to briefly say a few words about TrickStop because they're allowing us to meet every month. So it's nice to say thank you to, to them. So it's, it's evidence-based therapy. Basically the whole program takes eight weeks to complete, and it's a combination of habit reversal training and acceptance and commitment therapy both empirically proven treatments for hair pulling. You work with a the therapist, even though you work in writing. So you can work, so you can basically write any time that you can find free at night, in the morning, at work, anywhere you like. And because it's done in writing, it's much more affordable than standard forms of therapy. So you can check out the website if you like, or if you don't want to join the program or cannot afford to do that right now, you can start working on hair pulling by using the self-monitoring app, which is free. So you don't need to pay for anything to use it. 